Good morning. This is the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society Science Chat. And um, I did would want, want to remind people um, to please visit our websites. And if you haven't uh, renewed your membership, uh, please do that. And that uh, we do have upcoming conference on July 19th to 22nd in Vancouver, BC. Uh, so today is April 1st. 2017 and uh, today we have a special guest uh, Ray Fleming who has just uh, published a new book the 100 100 lies in physics and so um, I'm just gonna let hand over the uh, discussion to Ray and make some open remarks and then we'll see where we go from there all right Ray so tell us about your book Okay, this book is a follow-up of my first book, The Zero Point Universe. And that came about because I was looking at how do we look at the universe in light of the proven existence of the Casimir effect. Because the Casimir effect is a retarded Van London van der Waals forces. And that has many implications. Um, first, it means you have to have dipoles in order to have van der Waals forces, charged dipoles. Then you have to have dipoles that are interacting such in the London fashion, which is more of an instantaneous dipole. Um, Maybe in you this should case, uh, uh, go back and explain a little bit more about what the cashmere force is. Some people might not be familiar with that is. Okay, if you're not familiar with Casimir effect, um, Casimir hypothesized in the late 40s that if you put two plates close together, that vacuum wavelengths could be um, removed from that volume that were essentially larger than the distance in the space or um, a wavelength that couldn't be reflected between the plates uh, because of the wavelength had an, an odd fluctuation, say quarter wavelength reflector, that sort of thing. So what that does is it, it minimizes the amount of energy in that space. So he thought that if two plates were close enough that they would be pushed together that these van der Waals forces between the dipoles in space would be diminished in between two plates while the pressure coming from outside would be greater and the two plates would be pushed together. It wasn't until 1997 that this was proven experimentally to be correct and the initial experiments proved it with a plate and a sphere. In some instances, you can even get a repulsive force um, out of it. And so it's not always attractive. And there's been a lot of work in developing this and it's become very important with nanotechnology, particularly related to nanotech and graphene devices. So there's a lot of uh, work in that aspect of it to better understand the Casimir effect. And the Casimir effect has been shown to be a van der Waals force. Well, I was curious, uh, why was it so difficult to demonstrate the Casimir force? I mean, I know if I take two steel, ordinary steel plates and I stick them together, I don't seem to get any attractive force. Well, it doesn't show up until you get about one micron apart. And in order, and, and in his calculations, he was dealing with conductive plates. Uh, so you had to make sure that you had a material that was was highly conductive. But a lot of it was just that science was, scientists have been skeptical of the existence of dipoles in a vacuum. And I think the skepticism kept people from experimenting with the idea, even though other physicists before him, such as Paul Dirac, had, had hypothesized that the vacuum was filled with, with particles, um, vacuum fluctuations. But in any case, the, 
the existence of the vacuum fluctuations as shown by the Casimir effect shows us that we do have these dipole interactions. So we have pluses and minus charges in space. They are interacting with each other in Van der Waals forces. We get Van der Waals forces that are linear. We get Van der Waals torque, which uh, inhibits rotation and motion. We also have pressure being produced on bodies of matter. And whenever we have differentials in pressure, we get motion. And what I've recognized was that um, a number of things, if you have dipoles in space, then those dipoles become real electric and magnetic fields when they're polarized or rotating. And not only that, when they're polarized in an attractive sense, it reduces the Van der Waals pressure between the two charges such that they will be pushed together. So the Van der Waals, the Casimir effect is not just a microscopic phenomena, but it works on a broad scale in explaining physically how charges and magnets are pushed together or pushed apart depending on the pressure in the vacuum. And when we look at basic physics with these, with these fundamental dipoles in space, it changes a lot of what we thought we knew because much of the physics developed in the last hundred years um, avoided dealing with vacuum energy and certainly didn't think about it in terms of it being physical dipoles. And those dipoles are typically modeled as electron positron, but for a number of reasons that are outlined in both my books, uh, I also consider that there must be proton, any proton type dipoles as well that are polarized in both electric charge, but also matter and any matter orientation. And that goes back to a paper that I presented at the MPA conference in 2012 on um, a theory of uh, electromatter force, where if you look at matter, um, electrons are repelled from electrons at, at very close distances. There's a strong repulsive force, much stronger than the electric uh, repulsion. And that has long been considered to be part of the Pauli exclusion principle that two charges or two sources can't occupy the same space. So they repel very strongly. But you also see the same thing between electrons and protons. So it's not just a Pauli exclusion principle deal. It, it's bigger than that. And also we see that in the strong forces, we see repulsion between protons and neutrons. So we have this repulsive force. And then if you look at the matter and antimatter, then they're attractive because of course, once they get close, they come together and annihilate. And so instead of having this quasi poly exclusion principle repulsion, once you have matter and antimatter, you have what looks like attraction. And there's no, there's no, uh, nothing about that is controversial. I mean, we know that matter is, has, is highly repelled from matter at close distances. And we know that matter is highly attracted to any matter at close distances. But people don't think about it in terms of that acting like a dipole, which it does. And if once we include that, we can look at mechanical forces in a very different way. And inertia becomes a simple matter of looking at a dipole of matter in space, uh, self-induction without electric charges. And so I combined all those things. And then, as I said, looked at each major theory in physics that I could try to stick with the the higher, higher level ones as much as possible. Uh, but I also wanted to write this book in a way that where I could build on the evidence and build on 
the the physics so that someone could follow it and see what see how important having a dipole vacuum is to physics. And so that's how I came up with this book in part because the zero point universe didn't fly off the shelves as it were um, and I decided to come up with a name that was more controversial and and out there and try to give a bit of a gut punch to some scientists who who weren't thinking along the lines of Casimir forces, meaning that there's really dipoles in the vacuum. And so hopefully it'll get some attention and, and hopefully it'll help with many of the things that other scientists in, in the society are working on because many of these uh, lies that I've listed are things that, that we talk about every day in the forum. And so I, I hope that other people will if not look at my proposed solution, look at other proposed solutions because there's definitely problems with all of these theories. And, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for discussion. If you'd all like. right. All right. So, right, you've got quite the list here. So, and you get right into it. You have a short introduction um, in your paper, which is interesting. You know, you're just pointing out the inconsistencies, and um, there are a lot of things that that scientists can't explain, and there are a lot of basically off-limit questions that you can't ask. And if you ask any of these off-limit questions, uh, you get to be considered a crank, right? Yes. But it's it's like this is like basic stuff, um, and uh, you know how can, how can we say we know anything if we you know, don't even know exactly how photons work or how charge works or how gravity works. We really don't know how any of those things work. <clears throat> so how can a physicist be so high and mighty when they really don't understand the very basics of forces? And, you know, you point out that uh, anytime we see some kind of, uh, of uh, movement or, or, or a force that that this fundamentally, we can usually only think about that as being some, something getting pushed, something touching each other or something. Yes, and that's that's really important point. The physics, the modern standard model ignores that, it ignores how bodies move. And as I was talking earlier about the repulsive force between electrons, um, Freeman Dyson proposed that that strong repulsive force that's when they when electrons are close together is what gives uh, matter its solidity. But it's also what allows the vacuum dipoles to push on matter because you get a very, very strong repulsion when they're virtually in contact with each other. And that's, we, things don't actually physical physically touch, but they reach the point where they have this, this ultra strong repulsion because two electrons can't occupy the same space. Yeah, and I have understanding some, uh, I have some yes. problems with, because people will often say that in order to keep two particles apart, there must be some kind of quote unquote repulsion. Um, but I tend to disagree with that. I, I tend to go more with the theory of solids in, in which case that there is no actual repulsion. It's just that uh, I, two particles simply cannot occupy the same space. So, you know, the, the force required to try and force them into that same space just rises exponentially. So, you know, if I have two objects, like, uh, you know, these two batteries, and when I push them together, you know, there are some people who say that that's the repulsion of the negative charges on the outsides of the atoms keeping it apart. And I say that's a bunch of BS. It's just that the electrons can't slide past each other. And uh, that that is what is causing the causing it to stop. But there's, but there's no actual repelling force going on. That's is how I would well, it. It, it depends on how you look at it. In, in terms of the basic physics, you're right. It's 
or as David likes to say, sources and sinks. Two sources can't, can't be in the same place at the same time. And so they, they resist it. And that resistance in some sense does lead to a repulsive force. In the case of electrons and protons, it gives you um, um, a barrier energy of 780 kV that an electron has to exceed in order to jump past this repulsion, uh, as I prefer to call it. But a as you said, when you look at it fundamentally and say, what is this? Then you can look at it completely in terms of just two particles not being able to occupy the same space. And that some of the, the lies I have in here deal with that, like the whole idea of a collapsing singularity and with matter occupying, particles occupying the same space and overlapping. And we see no evidence of that in a lot. If it happened, we would see it. Uh, quantum mechanically, uh, if there was statistical probability that two, elect two protons or two neutrons could occupy the same space, we, we would know it. And it simply doesn't happen. So the, the idea that matter collapses under, under high pressure is nonsense. Yeah, I think that would go to, um, well, that would once again go to the, the idea that what's keeping them apart is not a force. Because if it was a force, all forces can be eventually overcome given enough energy. So if it was a force that was keeping two particles apart, then with enough energy, we should be able to cause them to merge. But I don't believe that we, we observe that. And therefore, it's not a force which is keeping them apart. It's, it's more oh, it still uh, looks geometric. Like a it's still, well, can well. Because now, I you, think when you, you have two things in static relation to each other, you really can't tell what's going on. <laughs> but you do end up with uh, a dipolar situation because the electrons and positrons do not repel themselves from each other the same way. They end up being attracted and they will occupy the same space and annihilate. And because of that, you get, you get what looks like a dipole and acts like a dipole. And so it rotates in response to matter moving the same way an electric charge moving would cause an electron positron pair to rotate. And that's where it looks exactly like a force, uh, a field force. And even if when you drill down, the fundamentals are a bit different, it still looks like a field force on, in the big scheme, scheme of things. And that's, right. that was my points about there is no magnetic, oh, there is no me mechanical force. Right now, in the standard model, they don't list mechanical forces as one of the four fundamental forces. They leave it off completely. And, but those are real forces. And they need to be included. And they also need to be combined, ultimately, with electricity and magnetism, just like Heaviside tried to do back in the 1890s. Well, let's take a look at uh, some of your lies here. So I'm just going to slowly scroll through these things here. So hold on, hold and, on, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yes, sir. You Harry. just want to jump in and and confuse everything. Um, my question, this is Harry Ricker. My question is, why did you choose to deal with 100 lies? I haven't, you know, I think that's just too many. Um, it makes the argument kind of diffused. I'm not really clear from, okay, let's go back to the beginning. Based on what you said at the introduction, it seems to me, I didn't get any of what you said in your introduction remarks out of your book. I thought just picking 100 things that you were saying were wrong in your book. So your book doesn't seem to me to have a theme. Well, the theme is that modern physics is really screwed up. Uh, and yeah, so that was... I guess my point is, here's, here's my point. Uh, picking 100, quote, lies 
kind of I kind of got confused because I you know there were so many of these things you know and I'm looking at a hundred of these things and I'm thinking really you know I mean I found it hard to I thought it would have been better if you just picked on a smaller number of issues that really made your point okay I mean that's that's uh, sure a valid criticism the whole issue. wasn't huh? that your first book though Ray your your first book was about the the Katzmere force, and that was more about what we we had opened with. Yes, the, my first book, the Zero Point Universe, please, was directed please, more at please solving don't the confuse problem. the issues. You always confuse the issues. The, Let's talk um, about my question. What's the focus of your book? Well, the focus of, of my book is examining the current state of physics when you have to deal with the existence of dipoles in the vacuum. You know, I don't really, I didn't really get that out of your book. What I got out of your book and looking at it was that you were promoting an ether theory as a physicist or somebody who is a, a mainstream physicist, I would just have said, dismissed it right away as soon as I saw that part, because everybody knows the ether doesn't exist. Yeah, except it does exist because oh, vacuum oh, fluctuations oh, do exist and they're, they're equivalent to an ether. That would be line well, number. My question, here's my question I'm getting at. My question is, uh, stop, are you trying? Stop, what, what did you say, uh, the last sentence, repeat it, that everybody knows that ether doesn't exist? Correct. That's what the mainstream Correct. physicists so, think. As I told you before, you the, even, even the Einstein in 1924 admitted fully existence of it. What oh, this is a side about? issue. You this is a side issue. You don't, what, what, what is your problem this with is one hand? Okay, please be, be my question quick. is this. Why, Stop. if I'm, Stop. excuse Stop. me. I see no problem between 50 or 100. What, what problem you are dealing with with, with, with the transmitter? Why, 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 why you have a problem if there is 50 lines or 100 lines? So it's, it's just up to him. If it takes 50 or 100, it's, it's very, very nice. So be, you don't belong to this community. I told you before. What, who, who, who you are? What is this guy saying? Can anybody be understand quiet, what he's saying? Quiet, don't speak more. Let him let him speak. And don't speak I'm more. asking I'm no, asking him a question. That, Here's that my question. You, that doesn't exist. It, what is this for stupidity? I'm asking the question. The question is this. But, if but I'm a mainstream physicist, why let should I read don't this book? You are, you are the, the, the main person now and be quiet and let him speak. Switch if I'm a mainstream on. physicist, why should I Just read? Just a minute, guys. Just a minute, guys. Microphone and be quiet. <clears throat> as a, as, it as will, a, it will, uh, it will task is to disrupt this community and to to fight for mainstream mainstream things. So go in another in our community and don't don't be here. We don't need this. Uh, Can you uh, answer the question, right? Peter, here's my question. Just a minute. Peter. Here's my question. I, I'm a mainstream physicist. I have the same, Hold same on. Right to, to speak as you. Pe Peter, I'm going to have to ask that you not speak over other people, okay? Please wait. For other people to at least finish their sentence, okay? Okay, but uh, just no say the same to Harry and don't give him ten minutes in a row and no time for others. Okay. Okay. I'm asking a question. That that's fine. This okay, Harry, question. we'll let we'll let you answer your. When we will be will we discuss and when the when the main uh, discussion will will talk. Okay. Here's my question. My question is: I see this part. <laughs> And it says 100 lies of physics. Why should I read it if I'm a physicist? 
I didn't write it for our mainstream physicists because if they want to deny the principle between of Hawking radiation, if they want to do, deny that the Casimir force has been proven, then they will never be convinced of any of this. So why are you so, writing the book? What's uh, what's the benefit to me okay, the model, read the book? So what's your benefit? What is the benefit in reading the, the, the book? Question. And the benefit is, is that you can have an opportunity to understand how dipole interactions in in space affect our the way we understand physics and it changes a lot of what we thought we knew under the standard model and that that's what this is about it's just about pointing out problems with the standard model that are inconsistent with a dipole space. Well, I have to tell you, I don't really understand what that means. Okay, so switch <laughs> and I didn't get, I didn't get, and I didn't understand, I didn't really understand from reading the examples in your book. I really didn't quite understand what your point was. And so it sort of went over my head. That would be my conclusion. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay, fair enough. Okay, we have a question from Cornelius. Now you can raise your flag if you have a question. If you'd like to go in order. And I would ask that people not talk over other people. All right. So Peter, we appreciate your enthusiasm, but please don't try and talk over other speakers. No, okay. my main point was just that just that not Franklin to use the flags. That was it was not really a question. You know, I made a comment in the sideline too. I think it would help. All right. Well, I, I think just if people uh, show courtesy and uh, wait for other people to finish speaking, that uh, we could do that. Because I, I don't mind people uh, breaking into conversation, but when it happens all the time, that's not good. <laughs> okay. So um, let's, uh, I was going to go and we're just going to take a look. I wanted people in the participating in, in the conference to I uh, guess get a brief idea of the idea of, of the the uh, so-called lies that he uh, that Ray has listed here. You know, they're, they're they're my favorites here. Like, there's no ether, as we just mentioned. The mainstream thinks that there is no ether, which is the number one lie. And, and Ray mentions that these aren't necessarily put in any order of importance, but rather it's more of a hierarchy that uh, the the which 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 uh, lies depend on other lies. So. A lot of our lives would depend on the fact that there's no ether. So he has that as, say, number one. So we've got a lot of my favorites here. Um, uh, we got like magnetic monopoles, um, virtual photons, wave particle duality. We have some uh, special relativity things here. Speed of light is constant for all observers. We're getting a little bit of noise from somebody here. And obviously we don't have time to discuss all of these, um, but uh, if you have a specific one you'd like to discuss, we can go ahead and do that. So let's see here, we have uh, length of space contraction. We were talking about that last week. Uh, let's see here, we have, uh, we're discussing dark energy and gravity. Let's see here, with the speed of electromagnetic fields, we have something here. Um, now I can make a point about dark energy. The, the point I had was that if there's an accelerating expansion of the universe, then that is indicate, indicative of a force that since we have an acceleration, there's a force that's causing it, which means that we have in terms of Newtonian gravity, a summation of two forces acting in opposite directions, which is why Newtonian and rel general relativity aren't fundamental because they're summing two or more forces. And additionally, there's a third force that, or a third force component, 
that is needed in order to explain the spiral alarms of, of spiral galaxies. And people who in the electric universe side are aware that that behaves more like Maxwell's equations, where you have a Lorentz type force that is causing stars to be moved in toward the galactic center, which is in line with a mechanical force that behaves the same way as electric electromagnetic forces, but without actually being electric. All right, We've got so many, so many uh, topics here, like uh, quarks. That was my favorite non-existent particle. Um, let's see what do we get here. Um, you have talking about neutrinos. Uh, neutrinos have mass, uh, strong nuclear force. Let's see if you mention the weak force here too. Um, yeah, mass in is the, due to the Higgs field. The strong nuclear force. I actually bothered to do the calculation that if you look at two proton sized spheres and look at the Casimir force, you get a very strong attraction. And it's strong enough to overcome the repulsion uh, by about a factor of 100. So in terms of the strength, the Casimir force between proto two protons is enough to account for the strong force. Uh, as for the weak force interaction in neutrinos, if you have electrons and positrons in space, a free electron or free electron can annihilate with a virtual positron from one of these dipole pairs. And then the electron that had been paired with that positron now becomes free and stable. It inherits the energy state of the electron. And that's it's similar to what we see with Hawking radiation, except instead of a particle being captured by a black hole, it's captured through annihilation. And if you look at these particle pair annihilation production events, they can account for all quantum jumps, atomic orbital transitions, uh, low energy nuclear reactions, uh, and a host of other uh, quantum type phenomena that aren't explained by quantum mechanics. Yeah, I think you have a lot of things here. And I think we could, we could uh, clearly disagree on the specifics on what's really going on. But I think what's, what's important, I don't know, to like Harry's point, which is what's, what's the importance of this, is to just show that, you know, these are the, these, the suspect uh, concepts in modern uh, science that we need to reconsider. Hey, Ray, yeah. do you do you have a, you mentioned one thing about the Kashmir force that uh, I wonder if you have uh, an answer to or understanding of, and that would be that uh, you said it's sometimes repulsive and sometimes attractive, and from what I understand, that repulsion and attraction happens at different distances. Do you have a hypothesis on that, or have you read a hypothesis on that? Uh, well, I've read several papers um, that calculate that some of the instances where you get a repulsive force, and it is, from what I understand, it's just a matter of the geometry, uh, and it's not, it, it has to do with the electromagnetic interactions between the particles, um, and it's not, um, I don't know how to describe it. It's but it's just strictly based on the the van der Waals interaction effects between the dipoles in the space in in between different shaped uh, surfaces. Okay, I just uh, I was wondering if there was any definitive answer on that because I mean I have theories on on uh, on the ether and we all have theories on the ether, obviously. Uh, and Harry, to Harry's point, I think about ether and what the mainstream physicists think. I think whether the mainstream physicists determine to say there's ether or not depends on there are so many varieties of ether and ether that people describe. And so some physicists may say, yes, there's an ether. And like Einstein said, there was an ether. But if you look at Einstein's description of an ether, it's not typically what most of us would think of 
as an ether. Uh, yet under those conditions, he will say there is an ether. And the same thing is possibly true of a lot of physicists that if you don't particular particularize it, uh, make it electron positron dipoles or uh, fluid whirlpools and that because there there are so many different varieties and <clears throat> descriptions of ethers that I think that's why they probably just avoid the term the, the use of the word ether. Uh, but uh, you know I have a, also a theory on the, as the, I do believe the vacuum <clears throat> the vacuum force is is real. Uh, but there are other explanations for the, the push-pull appearance or activation between those plates that doesn't involve dipoles. Well, the, the force has been shown to be mathematically equivalent to London van der Waals forces. Uh, so it's hard to get London van der Waals forces without dipoles or impossible. But, but the, uh, there again, the, Va the Van der Waal forces don't show the push, calculate the reason for the push pull attraction at various distances. Well, it's just, it's geometry specific, and we don't have a good way to predict in general terms what cases are going to be repulsive or attractive. Uh, so a lot of people were surprised that if you look at a spherical shell of charge, that, that the Casimir effect is is repulsion. You get an outward and outward push. Uh, uh, because I didn't Casimir understand. himself had hypothesized that it might be an inward push, and that that's how you might get a stable electron. I didn't understand it to be geometry specific, as it was. It just varied with the distance between the plates. At a certain distance, it was repulsive, and a little bit farther away, it might be attractive, and a little bit farther away again, it might become repulsive. No, Maybe that's not the case. Alternating between distances. No, that's not the case. That's not the case. Okay. No, I'll no, it's. I'll have to research that some more because that that makes perfectly good sense to me. That it would do that, and that's the way I thought I had had read it before. That that's what it does do. No, no, it's it it depends on the geometry between the the two surfaces. I'll have to do some more research on that. That's not the way I understood it, but. All right, I see Bob Gray has raised his flag. Bob, did you want to say something? Yes, uh, good morning. Um, just to the uh, comments um, that were just made, there's a nice book called The For uh, Forces of the Quantum Vacuum, an introduction to Casimir physics, which um, I found extremely interesting. And it covers a lot of, I think, these uh, concepts and the math for the Casimir force. Um, and it goes into the geometry, you know, repulsion and some geometry, etc. Uh, so I recommend uh, people that really want to dive into that Casimir force um, to take a look at that book. My main question is, I'm principally researching and reading a lot in classical electrodynamics. Um, I'm finding a lot of problems with the Maxwell classical electrodynamics, uh, as usually taught in the textbooks. Uh, I'm wondering if you've come across uh, any more complete and more consistent classical electro magnetic theories and if you have any references you care to share along those lines i notice in some of your uh lies that you've listed um do relate to classical electrodynamics so I'm wondering what references you may have on that topic unfortunately i haven't had a chance to work through classical electrodynamics uh, thoroughly I, I do realize that there are a lot of people who have been doing some excellent work um, find, looking at different problems um, with basic Maxwell's equations and incompleteness as well. But I have not, um, I've not been able to put all that together myself, which is why I didn't list Maxwell's equations as one of my lies because I didn't want to write a chapter on that unless I could give it more justice uh, and and be a little more thorough in how I dealt with it. So unfortunately I can't really 
give you much more than what's what's in there just hints about what might be wrong okay, okay. all right well now that people have had a chance to look at uh ray's list and ray's only here for about the first hour anyways so if you have some questions for ray uh, uh, get those out let's get those out now uh, so does anyone have any want any specific topic uh, they would like to ask about Ray and in, in his hundred uh, list I've, I've for example I've, I've put up like his line number 77 Higgs boson which is a favorite of mine so you can see how he's, he is uh, trying to answer that but uh, what what other interests do people specifically have open up the Florida questions I have a question um, do you believe that the Casimir force is mediated by a quantum particle? No, no, it's just the dipoles interacting by Van der Waals forces. Okay, now that that implies it, to me that you're... It doesn't require an extra particle. Right, so that implies to me that you're taking issue with the whole quantum mechanical scheme of physics. Uh, in terms of gauge bosons being needed, yes. Uh, I, in chapter 18, I've got a lengthy list of, of problems with the whole gauge boson uh, concept. And the Higgs boson is even worse because of its mass. Um, and it's not necessary. That's the thing about the Higgs boson is we can determine the mass by relating it to the vacuum energy in the space that the particle interacts with. And I have a paper where I derive the mass based on Dirac's hypothesis that the mass energy is due to the energy it takes for a particle to exist in the vacuum. It basically has to exclude some vacuum energy. And it turns out that energy is equal to the mass. So the whole idea of having a Higgs field to explain it is is not necessary. OK, but your primary argument seems to me to rely on the idea that there is some kind of energy in the vacuum, which to me doesn't really make any sense because Vacuum means nothing. There's no particles or anything there that could create any energy, right? Well, that's just traditionally they've called it the quantum vacuum and that the vacuum fluctuations do exist. And but it's still considered what we think of as being normal vacuum because those particles are not there long enough to be detectable because they exist on the Planck time scale. Yeah, well, what, what do you, what do you think of... space exists of? Because I'm a little bit confused because you talk about there needing to be dipoles, but you don't yeah. specifically say what the ether is. So is it positron electron dipoles? Or, or is it something more mysterious than that? How do you see space? I see space um, as positron, electron, and proton, antiproton dipoles. Um, so it's a general, sea of those things? Is, is that how you see yes. it? It's a sea of, so in that way, because I, you know, it's, it's confusing to say that uh, there's vacuum point energy if people think that the vacuum contains absolutely nothing. But what you're saying is, pretty much the opposite that the so-called vacuum is actually chock full of matter. It is like almost solid with matter, positron electrons, and you also say protons and antiprotons. So it's full of matter. And then it's easy to imagine that there is always a certain amount of energy going through that, right? Yes. Yeah, and I it, think you're saying that space is polarizable is what I'm saying, but that's just my interpretation. Yes, like, that too. Space is polarizable. Yeah, any I dipole uh, awesome. material would be polarizable. Yeah, but there's no material there. That's the contradiction. See, I, I, I just see this model as being a contradiction. 
And well, that, there is material you, there, right? Right, Ray, you say there is material. There's, there's yes, material, there is material, as, material there. Material as the battery that I, I'm holding, right? There's, it's made, this is also made out of positrons and electrons fundamentally. And so also empty space is made out of positrons and electrons. That's correct. That's kind of a contradiction because empty space contains nothing. No, it's full, filled. I mean, that's Ray's point is that empty space is filled with matter. Well, then it's not empty space. No, it's oh. not empty. It's not empty. It's, so it's that's, not that's truly the empty. Problem of the contradiction. But there is, there is no such thing as, as empty space. And, and I, one of my lies is non-space. And that's the idea that you could have space that is empty. And particularly space with no dimension or no time. It's it's like religious nonsense because it's not something that we experimentally know to exist and ever could know to exist. Uh, you could have you could have a void in space, which would essentially be an area where energy cannot be propagated or transmitted through it. And you can have a space where energy yeah, except can be there's transmitted no such through space. It. It's a fiction. That's a fictional space. Well, that's that's a, you know that's a matter of uh, like I don't have a particular space, but I do have a space that that supports tension. But there is points in that space which are truly void in which you can't support tension because it it's too weak to support tension. So therefore, energy tension energy can't move through it. It doesn't require particulates. The particulates are patterns within that tension. I so, want to add some opinion of uh, classical physics, three opinions. For instance, Descartes. Descartes says that uh, space to be entirely free of with matter, the formation of visual matter planets by Descartes happens from vortices of ether. Descartes' vacuum of space is not empty but composed of huge swirling whirlpools of material or fine matter producing what would later be called gravitational effect. Yes. So let me now add Einstein in 1924. We are not going to be able to dispense with the ether in theoretical physics, that is with continuum furnished with physical properties Every theory of contact action presuppose continuous fields, hence also the existence of an ether. And let me add the Newton, the Newton opinion, and Newton says that perhaps the whole frame of nature may be nothing but various contexture of some certain ethereal spirits or vapors condensed. Peter, can I just... Uh... Uh, I'd like my, to ask, see whether you have a question for Ray while it's here, okay? Well, I, my yeah. question is, uh, Harry, from, from what, uh, who is talking, Harry, who, except, except of Harry, who another physicist that is still talking that it doesn't exist? So all Einstein, Newton, Maxwell, Descartes, all are saying exactly the same, that space is full with ether and that the power well, I do have a question for for uh, Peter. Well, maybe Harry is talking um, about. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to sign off. I have a previous appointment okay. in about ten minutes. That I'm going to have to get to. Okay. Well, Ray, we appreciate you coming over here and introducing your book. And, yes, uh, and I'm um, sorry, I have a question for Ray. If you've got ten minutes or five minutes. I, I don't really. Okay, okay, sorry. I meant, I meant um, really when I said Peter, but, but I, I apologize. Have a good day. Feel free to pause a question on the forum for me, or um, or you can send me an email, I'm, I'm, and I'd be happy to, to discuss it further. I, I think a forum would be a good place if there's any additional questions You're for me. Speaking of the CNPS forum here? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, Ray. So does anyone else have, have a special topic they want to take a look at? And we could uh, look uh, to see um, what other people think and uh, what Ray thought. So we were looking at the Higgs boson there. And now, basically, Ray was saying that the data is suspect. It's a hardly statistical bump. 
in, in the data, and it's uh, basically not necessary to explain mass is how he did that. But with so many topics here, is there something that someone would like to specifically uh, delve into? Oh, I yeah. Was there an item number 50 or something like that? Or there's just so many of them, uh, but was it, he had- Let's uh, just pick one, I, I don't know. Yeah, so what was I, what was I on 50? It's something on gravity. And there was also uh, item just number one. Uh, let's see, I think it was, uh, yeah, you know, 51. It, it's gravity really is due to mass. Yeah. Well, he's, gee, if gravity isn't due to right, mass, then what is it due to? Uh, he's saying that's a lie. Is that correct? He's, he's, that's he's, right. He's saying that's a lie. So let's go to page okay. 151 and see what he's saying there. How could that not be? Certainly, gravity is dependent on mass. 51. Well, I mean, I happen to agree with him, but. Uh, I would like to see what he says about it. Gravitons are lie, gravity, and finally, gravity is due to mass. Uh huh. You see, how there's a gravity mass relationship. I guess I'm not seeing. So I think ultimately he's saying that gravity is due once again to the Casimir effect. All that would still be dependent highly on the a quantity of mass present. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with that it's due to the Casimir effect, but it's more of a, it's, it's due to, to the vacuum energy, but it's due to an amplification or a, of the vacuum energy by being concentrated to a point, which which becomes mass. So it's basically gravity is, is mass is caused by gravity, not mass gravity caused by mass. What was that again? I'm not quite sure I understood even your. Well, your, what uh, he what he's saying, I think, is gravity is doing to the Kashmir effect, and the Kashmir effect is basically the attraction or the. The, the, the pulling force within the vacuum energy and gravity or mass is basically uh, the uh, amplification of that by geometry where the that vacuum energy is focused to a point and that focal point of that vacuum energy gives us the characteristic of a mass rather than mass being the source of the energy it's the focal point of the vacuum energy and I think that's what he's trying to say by saying that uh, mass is not the source of gravity. Well, I find that a little hard to understand because, you know, the Casimir force uh, and its ilk are known to be short range effects. Right, but the Casimir of millimeter effects. Right, but the Casimir force is a force that's measured between two large flat plates. If you were to take one of those plates and, and make it into a sphere, and you reduce the size of that sphere, because the cashmere force is pu pulling against the opposite side of the sphere, the smaller you make the sphere, the greater the force. So as the sphere gets smaller and smaller, you get a stronger and stronger force, and that, for that, that force becomes the, the gravitational, the focal point of, of the gravitational force, which becomes essentially the mass. So that becomes such a strong gravitational force and such a localized location that you then have mass. And so rather than the but mass I don't creating- I see how it, that works over, a, I still don't see how that works over an earth-sized object. Yeah, that's, you know, that, that goes into much deeper uh, dynamics than just, just a static cashmere force. You have to dynamically maintain that, that shape, that spherical shape over and over. But but anyway, that was just an interesting point that he made. I, I'm in agreement with that. Uh, I just wonder how he described it. Yeah, it seems that this seems to be a, a a main theme in Ray's work here, is that he always gets tries to relate things back to the Kashmir force, which which is essentially the vacuum energy. Yeah, so essentially the vacuum energy. 
So uh, if you guys are really interested in it, it would probably be a good idea to review his first book, where he basically um, describes what he's thinking about in that department. I mean, like I said, this, this book is more of a, a result of what things don't make sense if you, if you have uh, that, the, the Kashmir theory in mind. So, although I would probably disagree with this particular statement that gravity is due to mass, I, I think that the, the, there's a clear relationship between the, those two. And that well, you're, not saying, whatever... you're not saying there's not a relationship, you're just saying it's, it's the other way around. Mass is due to gravity. Mass is due to gravity. Yeah, I would probably disagree with that. So, that's interesting. So what other topics are there? Now I was thinking, let's see here. Let's get back to our list here. So who else would like to pick a topic here? Pick a topic, any topic, any topic will do. Don't turn it into a circus, there, John. Oh, hang on. I want to see it. It sounds like you're being a circus salesman there at the, at the booth. <laughs> Just kidding, Mark. Frank. Well, let's see. Let's go to one of my favorites, uh, quarks. Let's see here. 182. What do you got to say about quarks? Okay, 182. Shot past it. Here we go. Quarks. Okay, physics. Uh, what was this quote here? Are you ready to drop your theory if the 700? I'm not quite sure what the relevance of that quote is. What is he saying about quarks? He's saying that the quark pinion model is a lie. So he's saying quarks have not been experimentally verified to exist. That has always been my point. They've never been seen in the laboratory. Maybe we need something similar, simpler than quarks. Quark theory requires 102 particles. So ultimately, I think he's saying that since quark theory is too complicated, that we need to go back to uh, particle theory with electron-positron pairs. So that's what he's basically saying. So given the assumption that there's dipole space, then that eliminates the need to have all these quarks. So once again, he's going back to his original theory about the Casimir theory to explain quarks. So what do people think about that? Is that a reasonable response for quarks? Or do people think quarks exist? You guys are not saying that much today here. Well, I, I personally don't think, uh, I mean, I think quarks is just uh, the material, materialized view of, uh, of quantum quantization they just want to i don't think uh, quarks actually physically exist but i think they are used to model the fact that you know energy transitions happen in specific steps and so they say you know each step is a certain amount of energy so each step is represented as a particle it can be a quark uh, i think it's, it's a 
I don't believe they physically exist. All right. Well, that's the way I feel. I feel that uh, this whole idea of quirks is uh, utterly unjustified. I think it kind of goes along too with uh, what uh, Bill Lucas says that you know uh, neutrons uh, don't exist within an atom. There's a certain amount of energy that, that is equivalent to a neutron within an atom, but the the actual distinct separate neutron does not exist within an atom. Just that energy exists there. Now I'm looking for a recent uh, email thread that you know matter is equal to energy here. But I don't think I see that as one of his lies, the, in, the convertibility of matter to antimatter, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but he does have like special relativity here. We should go see what he had to say about special relativity. Special relativity. It should be one of his big lies, special relativity. So he's saying that what's wrong is that Einstein has made certain assumptions. Specifically, the ether does not exist. That in itself doesn't make sense. I mean, again, Einstein did say that ether did exist. It's just that a lot of people don't care for his description of ether or don't understand his description of it. And that's probably why he avoided using it originally, because too many people thought ether is particularized or had particle-like characteristics and he, he uh, his description says that it doesn't have separate parts that can be tracked through time and that's kind of mm -hmm. hard for a lot of people to fathom yeah i think that uh, well, in all, during the, that speech, all the physics books say it doesn't exist it, it, excuse me harry well, the physics books, if you go to the special relativity textbooks, say the ether doesn't exist. But I thought he had a specific paper in 1920 that he wrote and a speech that he gave in the Netherlands yeah. where but he described people, it. He described people like the to point to that. People and, like and, to point to that. He said that it materially doesn't exist. So that's kind of, but it's well, a question I like of what. I kind of like to point to that because it's a very good description of uh, what ether could be and how ether works. <laughs> uh, it doesn't require particles. It it it's the uh, particles emerge from that ether, but there's no particle to it. It simply has a tension force. So it looks like Ray has got his list of things which are wrong and special relativity. So he wrongly assumes that there's no ether, wrongly assumes there's no standard rest frame, wrongly assumes that speed of light is intrinsic to a photon, wrongly assumes standardized frame is unnecessary, wrongly assumes the speed of light is constant all frames of reference, assume that light travels in the frame of reference of its light source, uh, wrongly assume the speed of light is constant for all observers. So I would say that the mainstream uh, generally assumes those things. Yeah, I would say that. Well, I, would uh, say Ray, I would say Ray says that the mainstream generally Ray. assumes those things, just like Harry just said that uh, everybody seems to assume that uh, Einstein denied there's an ether. <clears throat> yes, that's well, the that's problem with pretty what- pretty much taught in all of the books. I don't believe it was ever taught in any book I read from either. From, uh, from, it might've been taught in the book, but it's not what Einstein himself says. Einstein himself we says there is an ether. <laughs> Einstein himself says there's an ether, Harry. He, yeah, he gave except... a whole lecture on it. <laughs> except he gave he gave a description he, of the ether that couldn't possibly be physical. So it's like no, that was he, that didn't help. He gave a description of the ether that isn't easy to understand. <laughs> no, not easy to understand, impossible to implement, uh, or even you know, impossible to implement as particles. That's just yeah. another part. That's just another example of how they mainstream textbooks have confused the issue i mean it's just whenever you touch special relativity you just run into this 
irksome, confusion, contradictions. It just pervades all of special relativity. And, and, and he and said it had to basically have, if it was an energy carrier, the concept that the ether has to be filled with electron positrons to attract each other and create an attractive force is, just, is, is of no more sense than a, an ether that simply is an attractive force. Because if you have an electron positron that attract each other, you still have to explain what's the f attractive force between them. Why are they being attracted to each other? Well, just simply because they are. No, that can be explained. It can be. What's what's between them that attracts them? Ether. Well, the thing is, well, is that, is that, uh, well, the way, that, the way I explain it is that if there is any distance between the positron and electron, then yeah, there will be some ether in, in, in between there. What's can the ether mediate. made of? Electron positrons? Yeah. You're back, you're back to an ether that, that, that doesn't, that doesn't exist. It sure it does. If what's your electron wrong with positron the... is your ether, then what's, 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 a, what's between the electron positron that's making the attraction? Uh, nothing. When the, when the electron well, no, and no, no, positron said, is... Well, nothing. There's no ether then. Yes, well, there's no ether between the positron and the electron. In a, how in do they dipole. attract? They don't. When a positron and electron are right next to each other, the attractive force goes to zero. So as, as, as soon as you push them apart, what's the attractive force? Well, as soon them? as you push them apart, then ether particles can get in between well, wait, those wait, wait, two, wait, wait, wait. and they can the mediate the force. The, electron, the ether is the electron positron. Now you're going around in circles. No, no, no. There's two different particles here. The ether particle which okay. is, which would be a positron electron dipole very closely bonded okay and it has very almost no electrostatic field around it due to that bonding so it's what, what's like, what, what is, okay it's, it's bonded you got an electron positron bonded if you have a spare electron not bonded to another proton that thing has a huge uh, electric charge surrounding it so it's way different than the uh, surrounding ether so you have an electron positron dipole ether that's then the electron positron dipole remains a dipole because they're they're very strongly attracted to each other. And they the thing is is that the the ambient thermal energy will tend to drive apart the positron electron dipole pair. But as soon as it tries to do that, then ether will be able to seep between the two particles and then it drives them back together. Oh, okay, so what's the no ether made of that's seeping between the two particles? It's made out of positron electrons. What's right? the positrons electrons? How, how, how do they how do they attract each other? Because you have they have to then pull on the electrons positrons you pulled apart in order for them to attract together. So so it, you get yes, a they pulling. They, they pull. So how do they pull? They pull in in my theory. They pull due to phased interactions so you have a that, continuous tension field that's all you've got well there's a continuous balance and there's a there's continuous input of energy so if you have a a, a, like a positron on one side an electron on the other side yeah now if there's nothing between them there is actually no force between them but as you separate them it's like the positron electron dipoles would be kind of like the air between the batteries right the batteries are relatively big, but they're still like, as soon as you separate them, there can be air between them, and therefore the sound waves can travel between these two, these two particles. Where are the sound waves traveling through? The sound waves are traveling through the air, or in okay, this case. You've got, you got air. What, now, those, now those are electron positrons in, a, in, a, in an empty space. What's between them that, that, that any kind of energy is traveling through? Once again, I mean, it sounds a little bit circular, but it's not. It, it, is yeah, that, it the thing is, is that the, the positron electron by themselves are like these batteries. They're huge. But when they come together and they form this dipole, they become like the air, which is microscopically small. So, so they, they shrink to nothingness. Basically, they yes, still, they shrink they to still nothingness. So, so basically, uh, so basically yes, they will got, still attract each other. They're like this. Well, and this is why I'm trying to. They're like this, but the the ambient thermal energy will constantly try and knock them apart. So they'll be like this. Energy will try and knock them apart, but as soon as they do that, other other uh, positron electron dipoles will get between them, uh, forming a medium between them, and then that way they 
once they once that happens, they'll see the attractive force because this thing and this thing are at opposite phases. And as soon as you do that, basically the particles on the outside push it together. And it, it's going to be, I, I believe, some kind of equilibrium. At some point between the pushing and the pulling, uh, they will stay at a relatively fixed distance to each other. And they're generally being negative, uh, neutrally charged at that point. But there's just there's the there's the repelling force of just things being knocked around, and then there's going to be the attractive force of these oppositely charged phases. See, so and all this all this repelling force and attractive force is coming out of the ether, which is basically constant contact with everything. Yes, constant contact with everything. So you have one contiguous, unbroken tension field composed of ether, which ether is one contiguous tension field. Why have the particles in between? Why do we need electron positrons? Where, where because is, your, where space, is, your space where, needs to be made out of something real. No, your, spa your space is made out of a tension field. Uh, no, tension field doesn't say what the space is made out of. If you it's say the space is made out of it, is made out of, well, then your space would be made out of nothing, and that's what I object to. That's what your space is made out of, nothing. It's see, I, of I object to that, see, because I can't explain, for example, how is it that positrons and electrons can be ejected out of this nothingness. How can you explain it, that a positron is, is a positron and an electron is an electron? Uh, I explain that as just simply being the same particle, but ringing at opposite phases. That's the How do you explain a positron electron dipole? Where did it come from? Those will spontaneously form. From what? Well, if you have one which is ringing at this, uh, at this phase, another one ringing at the other phase, they will attract each other due to the phase interactions, and then they will spontaneously form dipole. That's what they would do. But the phase interactions change as they get closer and farther apart. Your phases change from in, in phase to out of phase. So if they attract when they're in phase and they repel when they're out of phase, as they move farther and cl closer and farther apart, they'll constantly move in and out of phase. So they'll attract, repel, attract, repel, and they'll just stay where they're at and vibrate. Well, that would be one of the quantum effects that you have to take in, into effect. Now, that's probably one of the but, harder things again, to believe they're about attracting, this. They're attracting and repelling through a void. Well, they wouldn't be if, if, see, if space is solidly filled with matter. There you go. Space is solid. Now you're coming along. Yes, it's space solidly it's filled with matter. Solid. It's, 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 it's like a cup filled with water, right? It doesn't need particles. Uh, it yes, needs, it, it does. It just need needs attention from air that, that, that is stretchable, that is variable across it. And from I mean, the, the tension, thing is, from if, the tension, you can derive particles. It no, needs you, the you cannot. It needs the vacuum energy. No, I don't think you can derive. I mean, that's the main product part problem I have with um, that's not the making. You have with, that's the problem not, you have with matter being able to convert to energy, or matter matter being able to emerge out of an energy pattern, is because you don't under you don't believe that that is the case. You don't believe that you can create an energy pattern so strong that it can have the properties of a piece of matter, which is mass. Yes, that's right. Or, that's mass right. And charge. See me nodding up and down. Yes, that's right. I don't believe that well, at all. <laughs> and, and yet you I, can believe that there's an electron proton that has attraction between it with no, no cause for the attraction between them. You're, well, you're, we know, you're back, we you're know experimentally, on, you know. Well, we know experimentally that positrons and electrons attract each other. We do we that. We, 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 do know know that. We, know that, we know that positrons and electrons are patterns of energy that are attracted to each other. So that's correct. Well, I, can't that, I can't we, explain we also, that. I can totally explain that. <laughs> we also know that positrons and electrons annihilate each other. And we know we actually don't know that. That 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 that's one of the the uh, the lies I was looking for in 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 Ray's book. But I don't think he mentions that. That no, I believe he that, that is... Ray, Ray feels also like you do that the. Uh, Vacuum is filled with an electron positron C, and he actually adds protons and neutrons or something like that, you know, other parts. Uh, so they also become invisible once they separate from the and no longer become an atomic pattern. Well, it still sounded like Ray believed in annihilation. I mean, I don't. I think that the simpler answer 
is that the positron and electron just become the ether dipole. And that that's as simple well, as it is. I think we better let somebody just, we'll let somebody else step in here. Harry. I see Harry's quietly listening. Well, I, I would mean, say to... is that um, the issue really boils down to, and I I felt this right at the beginning when Ray started talking, and then when he started talking some more, the issue sort of boils down to when you talk about a hundred lies of physics, it sort of boils down to what do you mean by particle? What do you mean by mass? What do you mean by vacuum? And these, all these ideas, you know, they, they are model specific, I think. And so I asked the question, you know, what is the mediating force of the Casimir force? And he said, there is none, but it seems to me that if you're dealing in physics and you believe in quantum mechanics, then you have to believe there's some kind of mediating particle, a photon or something. So to me, this is kind of where it all gets messed up because the, you know, you have this concept particle, wave, uh, mass, matter, uh, energy, all these ideas, they mean they're, they're not really as clear as we would like to think they are. That, that's kind of my conclusion. Yeah. Well, well I, I don't know. Ray, I don't Ray know how with quantum physics, and I do believe in quantum physics, but I, quantum physics only tells me that energy's packets, energy only comes in certain packets and it, it only makes an exchange in certain packets. But I have no issue with that because as far as I'm concerned, uh, energy only comes in full waves at a time. Uh, and uh, each wave contains only so much energy. Uh, the amount of energy it contains is strictly dependent on the resonant frequency of its of its source. Uh, and uh, basically, there is just one resonant frequency. As long as there's a specific frequency that everything is at, then at that frequency, you have a specific amount of energy per cycle. Uh, regardless of where you're at, and that and that's the quantization is the the wave, an individual wave itself is a quanta of energy, and so there's no problem with with uh, quantization in that sense, and you still don't need particles. You still have wave shapes that can give you the properties then of particles. You could have wave shapes to give you the property of mass. You can have wave shapes that are to give you the property of charge. You can give have wave shapes upon wave shapes then that gives you we actually uh, you have wave shapes to give you mass you have additional wave shapes upon those wave shapes to give you a charged mass you have wave shapes upon wave shapes upon wave shapes that give you a magnetized mass and you also have tr wave shapes that re derive from the interaction of charged masses that give you electron photon or give you uh, photon waves and so all the previous waves were all were all uh, basically due to uh, the, you know, the mass wave is the transverse wave, the the charge wave is a transverse wave with a or I mean, the mass wave is a, is a is a uh, compressional wave or, or a longitudinal wave, spherical longitudinal wave provides a mass, a spherical longitudinal wave. With a transverse wave rotating around it on each on each wave, superimposed upon each wave, uh, like a uh, like an orbiting uh, what do you call it? Uh, but you see here, Cornelius, I don't really know what you mean by wave. Okay. And what if you're talking about uh, waves, uh, waves require uh, mediums. What I'm speaking about from from a standpoint. Well, I'm just saying at a philosophical level. I, I mean, I'm just saying. Okay. That, I mean, I can sort of. Okay. Here what you mean by wave, what I mean, what I mean by wave is if you, if you have a tension field, and it's and it's uh, particularly flat, the tension is is the same throughout the field. Then, if you disturb that tension field and, in, and, and increase the tension in one area, the tension will have a tendency to distribute throughout the field. That does that make sense? I think I understand what you're saying. The the problem okay, so is that um, these concepts are 
they're really hard to grasp. And when you try to put together a model, my personal opinion about what Ray did is he called these lies. I would have said erroneous model instead of lie. So erroneous model number seven, photons are a force carrier. I wouldn't have said lie, I would have said erroneous model. And because that's what physics deals with, it kind of creates models and then tries to explain things using these models. The problem is the models that you use to explain one phenomenon turn out to not be able to explain some other phenomenon. And so you've got all these contradictions. Yeah, that's yeah. true. But then you got to, that's where this, you start with a very fundamental model and hopefully it can build up and explain every, every phenomenon on top of it. And that, that's what, well, that's just, the objective of physics. But so far they haven't yeah. accomplished it. Yeah. Well, and that's what this, that this, this fundamental thing is, is that's why we really don't need a particular ether because that means that you've already got the complexity of having electrons, positrons, and that. If you can just begin with a clean slate of strictly having a tensionable field, and that's it, you know, something that can be tensioned, it doesn't have to be particulate, it just has to support tension. Then from that, right. you can build all the patterns uh, in tension. Yeah, but then people will always ask you, what is that? material that's supporting that tension it's a tension field it, it is not see, see the thing is when you say material, when you say material automatically everybody thinks that material is particulate so you don't it's not particulate it's a tension it's a tension field it's a, it's 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 a diaphragm or a, or something that is infinitely it has such infinitely small particles in it that they no, they just merge into nothingness, and all you've got is left is the tension. It's the tension that does the work. It's the tension that makes us rec realize that there's a difference in tension from one location to the other. So that location looks uniquely different within space than any other location within space. And I basically, you know, tried to describe that uh, by looking at physically looking at bubbles on the surface of water and looking how to how their tension behaves and paying attention only to the tension, not because it's the tension between the atoms that creates the patterns and, and transports the energy. And it's the tension between those patterns that actually can become so strong that it, it, it you know is uniquely different in one location than it is another. Therefore you have a bubble. Yes. Yeah, and I it, believe I, I have understood your theory. And uh, you know, and and one thing that's okay here in science is that it's okay for people to disagree. So I'd encourage you to keep uh, working on your theory. I, but, I'm done uh, with my theory. I only think I, I, I believe it's wrong. So, describe. but that's okay. <laughs> okay, you know. I believe you're completely wrong. Okay, but that's okay. That's not any slight on you or your theory. I just think that it's incorrect. Well, I can, like I said, it can it can describe the entire mutation of pure energy. Uh, vacuum energy all the way up to a, an electron positron uh, magnetic field and there is absolutely no well, then, conflict it comes very I close would, to bill lucas's concept I except would. for bill has a toroidal electron that is uh, that is donut shaped and when you have a, a standalone electron the waveform is no longer donut shaped the waveform is basically a a a waveform, a transverse waveform that's moving around a well then I would wave. ask you the same question I ask everyone, which is can you give me a plausible explanation for how when gamma rays are injected in the vicinity of an atom, it produces pair production, which is always one positron and electron ejected 180 degrees apart. Yes. How does that work? Please give me a plausible explanation for how that works. You have to understand what mass and gravity in an electron is first before you understand that. You have to understand. So you're not going to give me the answer then, are you? You're not going to give me. The, you're not going to give me the time to give you the answer because fundamentally you have to understand where mass is derived from gravity to begin with. Because before you can have anything in, your, in atomic shape whatsoever, you're going to have to generate the mass. You're going to have to generate the charge, and you're going to have to generate the electric, the the photon. 
a pattern. So right. how long would it and take for you to explain count. that? <laughs> and can we yeah. have can we have a, a science chat devoted just to that, the, if it is necessary? You you could well, have. Michael, it. I think you're being a little unfair. I mean, come on. No, I'm being perfectly fair. If if, well, you, you if like Cornelius, you're, I mean, you're taking a particular question. example and then expecting him to create a model to explain it. That's not what we really need to do. We don't need him to explain a particular model. We need him to explain a lot of different situations consistently. I, I can't doing. explain anything unless I can explain gravity and mass relationship first. Uh, well, yeah. Because that, that's, 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 origi that's originally where it all starts. And you have well, to I'm just where asking a question about how pair production works. That's a perfectly fair question. And, and, and once you realize what mass is, and how mass can interact with other mass and how mass can become charged, then you can understand for yourself how power production works. But so until you you're, saying, that, you you're saying that you can't explain it to us right now in like five minutes? Absolutely not. Okay, that's fine. Because, because it's, it's You just can't not, explain it in five minutes. Now- I just I, tried to explain gravity to you and you can't understand that. So, and it's been much longer than five minutes. I mean, no, I, I understand it, but I completely disagree with it. There's a difference there. So in contrast, so you can't possibly explain how pair production works in five minutes. Now I can explain how pair production works in one minute and that it's done simply because the positron and electron are, are already existing in space. When the gamma ray comes in, that is just a compression wave of very high energy that comes in when it gets next to an atom, you know, it's going to cause a lot of force to occur on the positron electron dipole. This is why the atom actually has to be in place because it has to sit there and act as an inertial resistance force so that all the energy can actually be applied to the dipole. And then that gamma ray serves to break the binding energy between the positron electron. We see them flying apart at 180 degrees and that's why we see the positron electron ejected in pair production. So I can fully explain that in, what was that, two minutes? Wow, and now in another five minutes, I suppose you could, you could explain how a baby is made. <laughs> and that's not relevant. I mean, I just explained uh, how pair production you know, you've works. You've already got the mother and so, the father, and all you have to do is put them, to get, put them together and you've got a baby. Now, the, the, I mean, the, the point is- You've got the electron and positron, all you're saying is it's separated and you've got them. Yes, that's right. That's how simple it is. And that would but, be the advantage the of- Where did the electron and positron come from? They were always there. That's the simple answer. They I, were always I, there. I can take an ice cube and hammer it apart and, and have snow and, and say, well, it was always there. Yes, and that is the easy, simple, straightforward answer. Well, but where did the water the, come from? The, the point that where I'm saying is that, is that you cannot explain how pair production works in you know, five minutes or less. Now that, that doesn't mean your theory is wrong, but if you've got another theory that can explain how that works in like two minutes completely, then uh, that's why that's why I choose to pick that theory because it's much easier I to explain. Think, like uh, Harry said, I think you would find it hard pressed to find anybody that can explain how para production works. And I don't think you'll find anybody that accepts your explanation as being how para production works. Well, let's open it up to discussion. I mean, I don't think that that's very hard to believe. The 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 uh, analogy I always bring up to is like you know hydrogen and oxygen. So if you put uh, no, my last question is what the heck's this gamma ray that you're talking about? You say you say I got a gamma ray or whatever it is. What's that? What's a gamma ray? That's your explanation completely neglects what that is. Well, we don't really need to explain what that is. That is just something that comes from the experiment, like gamma ray generated through like, uh, I don't know, like x-ray type equipment. So your explanation is based on not knowing what the fundamental uh, causal causal agent is. Well, we so do know what the fundamental- any idea what the causal agent is in your the, explanation. No, we do know what the causal agent is. I mean, mainstream knows what gamma rays are. I don't think you'd have any problem. Are you sure with you do? People. What yes, is it? They, is it a they detect them. Is it a wave? What is it? it in my opinion, it's a wave. How do you generate it? In mainstream. 
What's it traveling through? How did you generate it? Well, you can find out how to generate gamma rays just by Googling that on the internet. Uh, can you find out how to make an electron positron? Well, in my opinion, you can't make an electron and positron. They always exist. Okay. So it's easy. So to it's just a, a matter pair. of uh, it's, easy create, it's easy to create a pair of something that already existed because the pairs were already there. Yes, exactly. That would yeah. be the simpler answer. Yeah, that would be the very simple answer because, but it would be useful. It would be very useful. Why would it not be useful? Because an electron po electron is huge compared to your electron positron dipole. I, I don't even want to discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> well, in science, we're trying to find some set of consistent answers that match. Well, some I, I've given you a consistent uh, answer. I told you that you can create from a simple one field that's a tension field. You can derive everything. You do not need the complexity of an electron positron. You can actually explain the creation of an electron positron. And if you can if I can explain the electron the creation of electron positron and the electron positrons that once I create them are not going to just stick together in, in, in invisible patterns in space. If they if they come together they're going to cancel each other. Just like a divot in a in, in the surface of the water and a bubble in the surface of the water are going to come together and they're going to cancel each other. They're going to disappear into the surface of the water and they're no longer going to be distinct unique items. They're going to be dis dissolved and spread in that tension within those divots and within that bu bubble is going to be totally dispersed throughout the surface. It's not going to be localized anymore. Well, Cornelius, I would invite you to, if you, if you think you need more time to explain how pair production works, um, you can come and explain that to us. I'm not going to explain how pair production works. I'm going to explain how mass becomes into existence first. I'll, I'll explain that. Because pair production, like I said, require that you understand where, the, where math is derived from, where charge is derived from, and then where magnetic fields are derived from, and then you can figure out for yourself where pair production is coming from, because it's not a simple interaction of fields of, of waveforms. It's a complex interaction of waveforms, and it is very difficult to draw because it's a three-dimensional compact inter interaction of two spherical wave patterns, which have transverse wave patterns riding upon them and on top of them. And, you, and I don't think I am not, not capable of drawing in three-dimensional wave shapes like that. And that's why you have to build up to those steps. You can certainly visualize it, but drawing in three dimensions doesn't work. All right. Well, let's see. Let's get back to Ray's book here. So I know we do have some other people here that haven't uh, chimed in. Like, let's see, we have uh, Bill and Jim here. And I was wondering if you guys, were there any, any of these topics in particular caught your attention? Um, by the way, you can, this is Bill. You can go online to uh, uh, Amazon.com or uh, and you can uh, read a big portion of his book for free. You don't have to actually purchase it to see what he has to say. You can see all the lists and you can see uh, about half of the uh, topics. Um, the uh, <clears throat> the problem I see is a uh, trained theoretical physicist is that um, a lot of people don't really understand the experiments and the data and they take a more uh, beginner type uh, approach and so um, <clears throat> it, it there's a lot of inconsistencies and that sort of thing that we we have when we have a conversation so they're often not real profitable in that sense but uh, uh, the uh, approach that people such as myself take uh, has uh, basically uh, addressed all these issues but they don't seem to know about these things so uh, you you would you would say that you've also have like uh 
uh, theories which explain uh, a lot of these things as well, but in different well, ways. My theories are based entirely on empirical data. So for instance, Winston Bostick, Bostick created uh, the toroidal ring or the monad in a laboratory. It's been repeated at many laboratories. Uh, he showed that the electromagnetic field is more fundamental than the particle because you make the particle out of the field. The particle does not make the field. The particle is made out of the field. No one else seems to pay any attention to that. <laughs> and uh, I would kind of disagree with that, Bill. Didn't I just say that the mass came from the, from the gravity, not gravity from mass? Well, gravity is not a fundamental field. Gravity is the secondary electromagnetic force and uh, it's due to vibrations of the uh, the monads within uh, elementary particles and uh, so yeah the, see and that's, that's that's different than what we what I just said earlier that gravity is actually the fundamental field and the particles are created from the gravitational field right see but the problem you have with that is someone just takes uh, let's say a very simple model of the atom. It consists of electrons and protons. <laughs> and the electrons can, if they're in an equilibrium situation, they can vibrate. And that vibration, if you calculate it, produces the force of gravity. And yeah, so see, that's the opposite force. way around. And so I, I have the force of gravity waves coming together to converge to create the point source that vibrates that is the electron. So you we're, we're totally reversed of each other. Right, but but logically, basically, the source of energy rather than the, the result of it. You can have that because uh, you can only have one one of our squared force that's fundamental in nature, and two, uh, all the theories of gravity, such as general relativity, involve C. As so as does electrodynamics, only one can be fundamental. Well, it, well, you're claiming the other one's fundamental, so I you, guess you, 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 you say the say force that. of gravity involves C, but the force of gravity is the, the speed of gravity has never really been determined. Oh, yes, it has. No, it hasn't. It's faster than the speed of light. Well, then it doesn't involve C. If it's a, you can't measure it if it's faster than but, C. It just... But in general relativity theory, it, which is of the theories that we have, uh, the, they they involve C. Yeah, but the, see, the thing is that that doesn't gra mean that gravity the limitation is on the speed of C. It just means that the uh, theories of gravity are involve C. They, they're measured. They're measured by variations in C. But that would be like saying that. Gravity is a longitudinal wave traveling through a solid, and light is a transverse wave traveling through a solid. And we know that transverse waves travel through a solid at different speeds than longitudinal waves. And as the tension or tension within that solid varies, the relationship between the speed of the transverse wave and the speed of the longitudinal wave varies. And that becomes the relationship between the difference between a mechanical vibration and electrical vibration, because the electrical vibration is the trans is the transverse wave, and a mechanical vibration is the vibration of mass and gravity, which is the longitudinal wave, and therefore you get length contraction and time dilation if you use the transverse wave to measure the variations and the longitudinal wave lane, wavelength change of gravity and mass. So it's the relationship between the two that give you the characteristics that we see in physics of length contraction and light and, and, uh, and uh, time dilation. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that because oh, absolutely. It's more there are three types of electric and magnetic transverse fields, three types. The current theory uh, of Maxwell's equation only re it has been watered down and approximations made to eliminate two of the three types of electric magnetic fields, but they are all measurable. And uh, 
So well, the, see, the distinction I make is that an electric field uh, and, and tra is a transverse wave, and a gravitational field or mass mass field is a is a longitudinal wave. Mass is due to longitudinal characteristics, and the charge and electrical fields are due to transverse characteristics, and they combine and transverse character transverse waves can superimpose themselves upon longitudinal waves. Well, but you see, experimentally, we know there are three types of electric magnetic transverse waves. There's also longitudinal. Okay, what are magnetic. the three types of transverse ele electric waves that we can identify? Yeah. Um, because there are very, basically, as far as I'm concerned, there's only one, so I'd like to know what how, how you distinguish the three. Okay. Um, let me let's see if I can give you the name. Let me look it up uh, the name of the. And how how would you distinguish their their shapes? Because I would assume that they're distinguishable by their shapes. And I would I would well, say that... uh, they're distinguishable by other things. And I'll I'll try to explain that to you. Okay. Because I see a transverse wave. If it's traveling in rectilinear format, then that that would be considered like a photon. If it's a transverse wave that's superimposed upon itself upon a longitudinal wave, then it's traveling around in a spherical or circular shape around uh, the focal point of the transverse wave, which would be the charge. Uh, those are the main two things I see. And then you could have a transverse wave that's riding upon a longitudinal wave that's focused into a point, and that would be and then that entire system could be moving linearly and that would give you a flattened transverse wave revolving around the charge, which gave you the magnetic field for and after the distance direction of travel. I guess, you know, so I, I see the transverse wave taking three, taking different dynamic, dynamic shapes or paths, but I don't see the transverse wave as being but a single transverse wave. Are you uh, finding the, your results the work, there? The work you need to find is uh, uh, the book by William J. Hooper, which summarizes his experimental work at University of California, Berkeley. And it's the okay. book title is New Horizons in Electric, Magnetic, and gravitational field theory. Okay. Okay. Uh, and magnetic. We, excuse, could you put Could you put that in the sideline on the chat? Uh, let me see if I. You can. know when you get a chance. Uh, and is that Is that just a book that's available? I suppose it's not available to read online or anything like that. It's probably um, purchased one. It is, and but the copy is very bad. Some someone took a xerox copy of a tight copy of the book <laughs> and put it online and the and they scanned the xerox copy and the well, xerox perhaps copy this... is poor quality i'm going to republish the book as soon as the uh i think this year the uh oh, copyright expires copyright expires and i i have at i have taken that version and uh, uh could, and and basically retyped the book and redid all the diagrams. Uh, okay. So, so that, uh, but it's, uh, but, but anyway, in that book, he measures something like 13 properties of electric and magnetic fields. Okay. 13 properties. For instance, some electric fields can be shielded and others cannot. But you're told that, you know, all of them can be shielded because they are, it's only one type in Maxwell's equations. And that, but yeah. in the empirical equations that he started with, there are three types. Yeah, see, and I, I, I would say that if it, if it can't be shielded, it's actually a gravitational field, not an not a electric but, field but anymore. But there's other properties you can measure also. There's 13 properties yeah. that can be measured. Yeah. So I think uh, I, I get the impression that the, I'm going to have to look at this book, but I get the impression that what he's really looking at is not just strictly a transverse or strictly a longitudinal wave, but he's looking at combinations thereof and still calling them electric fields. And and I think that's just a distinction of def definition, possibly, too. You know? well, but I, I do distinguish definitely between a uh, mass wave, mass gravitational wave, 
and a and a electric wave as being either purely transverse or purely longitudinal. Once you're starting combining the two, then certain portions of one could could not may not be shieldable. Like the longitudinal portion cannot be shieldable, but the transverse can. So let me look at the book if I get a chance and see if that's possibly the the a more of a definition thing than anything. But we'll and. Uh, uh, so yeah, if you would put that on the sideline, I would appreciate it. And maybe we better let somebody else speak for a minute. So uh, <laughs> yeah, because I don't want this to make it a so two-way conversation. But I guess anybody else could step in at any time. Yeah, certainly anyone can step in, and I encourage people to step in at any time. I mean, I'm just going through Ray's book, and I'm like picking out stuff here. I'm just showing it randomly. So last week we were talking about gravitational time dilation as not being true. So what does Ray have to say about that? Okay, so because we know that clocks run slower. So space, he's saying space dilation is a lie and time dilation is also a lie. But how does he explain the experiments? So he explains the experiments how. He's talking something about potential energy. He's talking about the thing that actually Standard clocks are in vacuum fluctuation. So I am betting he's saying that the time dilation is due to fluctuations in the Kashmir force. So he's getting back to that. That could well be. There again, you know, the way I was just speaking to Bill about it, there is a there's a difference between the electromagnetic or the photon light wave that you're measuring would be the transfers and the cashmere force would be the longitudinal waves. And there certainly can be a difference in the speed in them. And the speed in them is going to vary depending on the amount of tension in their carrier, in the carrier. Or in the case of if you look at it as a, as a solid material, steel or whatever, transverse waves the speed of transverse waves through steel versus the speed of longitude or of longitudinal waves through steel steel varies so if you look at one as being the physical clock the longitudinal as being the physical clock rate and the transverse wave as being the light wave light rate then you can see that as you put stress on the field or as you change your intensity of gravity if you will then then you can change the ratio of speeds of the two which can give you the characteristics of uh, time dilation of interaction. And I think he's uh, he's basically saying the same thing, but he's basically denying the time dilation and length contraction, uh, which, you know, if you're using the light as a ruler or the transverse wave as a ruler, then the longitudinal wave speed is going to vary. If you're going to use the light against light, then you're not going to get a variation. So it depends on whether you're physically measuring the distance with something other than light, which would be basically mass upon mass interactions or triangulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we kind of agree on that. So let's see, his next big topic, dark matter. I think you did mention something about uh, dark matter. So what does he say about dark matter? And a sideline too. I think Ron Hatch is uh, currently writing a bit on the uh, in the forums about uh, time dilation, length contraction. So you might follow some of that. Yeah, there's some people who are very strongly in favor of length contraction. I personally don't believe it, but yeah. I think people can say whatever they like, and well, as long as they're backing up what they're saying, that's fine. Experimental. Physicists who are working with accelerators, um, they can see the difference in the size of an elementary particle as you change its speed. 
So its size changes, which and that agrees with length contra length contraction. Yeah. That, it, well, I it, think that kind of depends on what you call size. I mean, when you're talking a fundamental particle, are you talking its effective field? You can size? tell uh, it's uh... <laughs> it's another particle, and what that diameter is. Yeah. Well, fundamentally, Bill, don't you think too that? Uh, Particles don't really have a size; they just have an area where their their effect is strongest, and they eventually the effect does eventually uh, fade into infinity. Yes, that's that's right. Because the electromagnetic field, you have a soliton that creates the the um, uh, monad, and the soliton uh, is in the is made of the field, but it goes the field all the electromagnetic fields have tensile strength and so the uh that's one of the things that super measured uh so anyway that field because of the tensile strength uh is continuous it doesn't just end at an edge like a marble we would think right. of a marble having an edge you don't have that on your elementary particles that's why uh the quantum idea of uh you know, the uncertainty principle gives you uh, a certain amount of uh, leeway around a particle uh, that seems to bear some resemblance to reality is because of this, uh, uh, the fact that the field doesn't stop at a particular place. It goes on and has tensile strength for a long distance. Right, and, so it's uh, a, the dropping off of tensile strength over distance yes. that, we're, that we're recognizing. And when the, when the drop is so insignificant over a distance, then we say, well, since it's no longer significant over this distance, we'll say, well, this is where it's mainly significant is over this short distance here. So we'll say 99% of the change in tensile strength happens over this distance. So therefore that, that we're gonna call it a diameter. Yeah, something like that. And, uh, uh, the, uh, and so these are approximations that are made. And, uh, and I think, most people realize that because there are electric forces and fields involved that and in gravitational fields that they can't uh you can't have a sharp boundary for correct for something and uh so uh, yeah so those are uh some of the situations and if you look at the like the experiments uh, where you create a monad in water you know like a swimming pool use a plate and you can make a pair of monads and uh when you do that you see that they're really like vortices and just like a, a vortex for a hurricane has a very intense center correct <laughs> you can see it but if you look at it like the weatherman does from a satellite well you can say oh well it really extends thousands of miles <laughs> you know with that vortex right. and uh so it's the same kind of thing when you uh look at uh, say uh, uh, an elementary particle like an electron or something but an electron is not a single monad right because monads don't have these uh, properties of charge or uh, mass but it turns out that uh, when you put uh, some monads together and make a monad structure it does have these properties mm -hmm. and so when we when we do pair annihilation think we got rid of the electrons all we did is go back to monad form and yeah. you can't see it and but the mass the mass the energy the vibrational energy of the monads that was creating the property of mass that uh energy comes out in the form of uh, electromagnetic photons and yeah. electromagnetic energy and so you think we have e equal mc squared where e is equal to all the energy but it doesn't include the energy of the monad it just includes the kinetic energy of the monad structure yeah and like I, th I think i i think i can create the the quantization that that uh, requires the use of monads uh without actually requiring a monad to do it because the monad again well, the monad is not like a quark the monad is like you said you consider the smallest amount of energy thing can change by, which is basically planks, right? A, the a plank mon the monad is is the building block of all particles. So 
for instance, a quark could be called an elementary particle, but it's not stable by itself. It has to be in a structure. Correct. So, yeah, I understand. Uh, but so, what, so anyway, monad uh, was monad was a uh, was a, like the equivalent energy characteristic of a of a a, a Planck value. Correct. Um, we don't use the Planck value. Uh, okay. It's very that's very tiny. The monad is uh, bigger than that. And oh, by the way. I, I did find actually for the the the, the Hooper paper, there uh -huh. is a website on rexresearch.com. There's someone apparently has gone ahead and transcribed it into a website. Right. Okay. Thanks for finding that, Frank. Right. I That's see, I see you're posted in the website. The, the, unfortunately, the equations and the diagrams are not perfect. You'll see when you look at them. But yeah, you can see a lot there, and you can see his table of the characteristics of. Uh, Let's say the uh, d different three types of uh, of electric fields, and so you you get a, co a concept of what that's like, and you also the this, the, the experiments that were done are described, so you can see how okay. they measured these properties. Well, it looks like we're getting here towards the top of the hour. I didn't give it get a chance to give you guys a big April Fool's joke or anything like that, <laughs> but uh, I was going to say the LHC had in fact found. Uh, the uh, ether particle as uh, positron electron dipole, and it's going to be announced uh, tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks. But, uh, <laughs> that would have been a good one, Franklin. Uh -huh. yeah. April Fool's. Okay. Um, no, they'll never find anything like that. Okay. <laughs> so, but today um, we uh, we had uh, Ray Fleming with us, and he was uh, uh, telling us about his book, The Hundred Greatest Lies in Physics. And uh, it, it seems that still a lot of his work is related around the idea of the Kashmir force. So looking at a lot of his uh, chapters here, that always seems to uh, run back to that common theme that there is, uh, that there is some kind of uh, ether uh, of, of, of a dipole nature and that uh, this fills all of space and this is what's really causing most of the the things and um, so and he, but he, he really wanted to create a more controversial book. That's why he was telling me that. That's why he used the word lie. You know, I told him, you know, that, that them are fighting words, right? And yeah, so he wants to see whether he can get more interest by doing that. So I hope he has success with his book. <laughs> And um, uh, I, I may bring back a couple of these topics uh, from time to time because I think this is a pretty interesting list of uh, controversial topics. Now, the, the thing that uh, I forgot to mention is that basically all of these concepts were invented in the last 100 years. So I don't think you'll find any concepts in here that really weren't invented prior to, say, 1905. Uh, so I think that is also interesting. A lot of people think that uh, when we started going, when we started running off the rail in physics is when we started to accept you know, non-experimental evidence and use mathematics all over the place to explain things. And as soon as we you know, let that go, then you know, pretty much anything was game. And in the past 100 years, we've come up with a lot of things which look like game. So, <laughs> but that would be... That would be my summarization of, uh, of what we've been talking about. Um, so uh, that will do it for uh, this edition of the science chat. And uh, we'll see what we come up with uh, next week. Until then, ta-da. <laughs>